Okay, students, so in the lesson today, we're going to challenge what Charles Percy Main said about the trenches being a wonderful experience. We're going to do that in two ways, by looking at two particular dangers within the trenches of the Great War. We're going to start with a video about these things called shells, we've got some real artefacts to show you, and then the second video, um, we'll look at the damage that bullets could actually cause. So first of all, let's talk about um, these things called shells in the Great War. OK, students, so first video today is about these dreadful things called shells. And shells is just another name for bombs. These are bombs. And what we've actually got here in front of us are some of the pieces from a real artillery shell from the Great War. Uh, two types of shell. So the first one we're going to explain to you that soldiers were very afraid of is something called a shrapnel shell. And when I put this back together, I'm going to try and explain how these dreadful things worked. So first of all, you've got what's called the shell case. So this makes up the bottom of the shell. This is quite light, made of brass, and that's what we call a shell case. Now inside of that, would be all the explosive. So when this is put into the artillery piece, something hits on the base here, it sets off an explosion, because this is full of something called cordite, and it sends the shell flying into the air. This piece uh, never leaves the piece of artillery. Once it's been fired, and you open up the gun barrel again, this piece comes back out. So that's not going to kill you, that's the shell case. Um, the second part then, this is the piece that's a bit more deadly, um, this is the shell itself. Much, much heavier, it's made of steel, um, and this is the piece that actually shoots off into the air. Now, that sits then on top of here, so on the shell case, and then when there's an explosion in the piece of artillery, it explodes here, and it sends this flying off into the air. One piece that's missing though, right at the very very top, so the last piece just here, this is what we call a fuse. It's a timer um, because there's a way of getting this to explode um, at a certain time when it's in the air. This shrapnel shell, you want it to explain when it's uh, explode, excuse me, when it's still in the air. So we'll show these pieces in more detail in a moment, but then that is the fuse that sits on top and this then is the whole shell. Now, um, just for a moment then, we'll show you um, what would happen with a shrapnel shell. Now, what is missing out of here is some of these, okay? Now, I'll put them on the work surface. They are very, very heavy, and what they are is they are made of a lead and another metal called antimony, They're very, very heavy, and they are round, spherical, uh, lead and antimony balls, and these were inside here. Now, I've got 50 original shrapnel balls here that have literally been picked up by someone walking the battlefields of the First World War, but actually, there wouldn't just be 50 of these in here, there would be 374 shrapnel balls in here. Now, to explain how the shell works then, when you place this, when it's all in one piece, then into a cannon, if you imagine, then what happens is, is this piece flies off into the air. There is a timer that is set here, and you want it to explode when it's actually coming down towards the front line or communication trenches. Now, if the timer works, then at a certain time, there will be a small explosion that it sets off at the top. That explosion will go down to the bottom of the shell, and then that explosion will actually burst out the 374 shrapnel balls down onto your enemy. Now, 
Those balls at that time are moving something like about 300 miles an hour. So if you are in the trench, you'll get showered with these rather nasty shrapnel balls. And if you are not ready, then you could find that a piece could go into you, go into your body, into your face, into your head, and these things did kill. Uh, we'll give you a little kind of um, look at that a bit closer up now, if we can. Okay, so um, slightly closer look then at these things. So um, first of all, if you have a little look here, if I just rotate this round, then um, it's always the case that when you're looking at um, the case on any shell, but this shrapnel shell here, um, you might be able to just make out just here, if I show you, and it's actually got the year on it. So this is 1916, two years into the Great War. This is a British shell. Um, it's definitely been fired because <laughs> it's missing its firing pin in here. So um, yeah, that would have been fired at the Germans, possibly at the famous Battle of the Somme in 1916. So that's the brass um, shell case. So we just pop that back down there for a sec. Um, let's have a quick look at the shell itself then. As I said, a lot heavier to lift up. Now, as I said, that's made of steel. Um, it's very, very thick because when the um, charge explodes in the base of this, um, you don't want the shell to break up into pieces because you want the shrapnel balls to fire out of the shell. This is why so many of these survive intact. Um, because when they fired, they literally just dropped to the ground. Um, one thing you might have just been asking about is if you have a look at the bottom there, look at that lovely view there. Um, that is what's called a drive band um, made out of copper. Now you can tell that this shell has actually been fired um, because originally this copper band um, would have been smooth all the way round. Um, it's actually got now, if you look there, you can see uh, it's indented here, so you can see the little dents um, that are slightly in between the shell. Um, what happened was, is that when that is fired, um, the inside of a gun barrel actually has a groove, well, a series of grooves um, that run round in it. Um, it's, it's what's called a rifled barrel. And when this is put in, because that metal is soft and it's sent off, then it actually makes these score marks into the copper band and it means when it goes in the barrel it will actually start to spin as it goes because the shells would be more accurate if they could spin so when that's actually sent off towards a trench it's actually spinning as it goes and, and men often said um, that with these trenches um, excuse me with these shells they're often called whiz bangs because the whiz that you heard was the whistling it was making as it was rotating through the air. Um, the fuse, just have a look at. Um, it's probably been fired, so, and the pieces on it, for example, you can see quite clearly here, so in this piece just here, um, this is the piece where you would turn it, if you could, um, and that's the timer on the fuse. And as you go round, and if I go really close, you just have to wait for it to zoom in, it's not so easy, there we go. You can perhaps start to see a series of numbers there as you turn round. So that's like setting a sort of stopwatch on a timer. So you twist this piece round. Um, so hopefully you can get it to explode whilst it's still in the air. And if you look very, very closely, if it does um, focus in, it's not always great at doing that. Sorry, I won't miss a second. Picks it up as it goes sometimes. Um, you may be able to see there, um, it's just here. This is also um, got a date of 1916 on it. Um, obviously I picked these things up separately and uh, it's the case that this probably doesn't match this, <laughs> um, but they're both from 1916. And then the last things to look at, these dreadful shrapnel balls, um, one here, just to look at um, sort of very, very closely. I'll just get that focused in. Um, nothing too special, but that one's quite useful to look at because you can clearly see that when it came out, it probably made an impact just here on something um, and it's squashed down ever so slightly 
Um, so these are what we call shrapnel balls. And um, if I drop them, um, you might be able to see, sort of, we'll get a feel for how heavy they are. Yeah, and they're made of lead um, and they are not very nice things when they're coming at you at over 300 miles an hour. Okay, so 374 of those in a shrapnel shell. Okay, students, so the second type of shell is what we call an HE shell. It stands for high explosive. Now, I've only got the same pieces that I've just shown you with my shrapnel shell because actually having the pieces to a high explosive shell is a little bit more tricky, and now I'll explain why. So you have the same thing again where the explosive is placed in the shell case, but the shell itself would look similar in shape to this, but then the fuse on the top wouldn't necessarily be a fuse. It would be called a percussion cap. And what would happen is, is the high explosive shell is always expected to explode, not in the air, but when it actually lands on the ground and it hits a percussion cap and it sets off the explosive inside the shell. Now, there are no shrapnel balls inside an HE shell, but what happens is, is it's packed full of explosive. So when it actually explodes, the whole shell case, everything breaks into rather nasty white hot pieces of metal that will disperse um, along as much of that zigzag shaped trench as it can get. And these pieces, can and did kill people. 70% of deaths in the Great War were caused by high explosive and shrapnel shells. So that's why it's quite hard to find um, one of these because obviously they're always broken into pieces unlike shrapnel shells. But in a moment when we actually do a little close up and um, what we'll do is, is you can still walk the battlefield and find huge amounts of pieces from these shells um, that killed men in the Great War. So we'll show you that piece, and um, particularly in a close-up when we look at that next. So that's a high explosive shell. Okay, now we don't have the pieces of a high explosive shell um, to show you. Well, a couple of pieces of one probably. Um, and that's because, as I said, um, when they land on the ground, they literally break into pieces that is the point. So you still have um, the same shell case helping you to fire them. But let's just imagine then, although this is the case of the shrapnel shell we showed you, that what would happen with this one is it would be filled with uh, much more explosive. And then when it actually lands on the ground, um, it doesn't have a timer fuse, it has something called a percussion cap. So when it hits on the ground, um, the whole thing literally explodes and it breaks into rather awful large pieces of steel um, that can kill very, very easily. Um, if you look just here, what is quite interesting is I've got probably a piece from a high explosive shell where it's exploded and it's broken up into smaller pieces. And this piece here, if you look, is probably the drive band from a high explosive shell. You can actually see where they match up. So the shrapnel shell wouldn't explode, but the high explosive shell is literally broken into pieces and you get left with these really, really dreadful white hot pieces of steel, where if it lands in a frontline trench, um, that will be coming across and can literally kill you very, very easily. Um, the pieces as well, the points um, can be remarkably sharp, um, so not very nice at all. There's one piece there, and as you may see there, there's another piece um, just here, probably again, you can see the copper colour um, from a drive band off a high explosive shell. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves for the Google document. So we've got the most dangerous thing in the trenches are the shells, two types. First of all, shrapnel shells, okay? Two points to get correct as well, is that shrapnel shells had a timer 
or a fuse at the top. They detonated in the air. And then you had 374 lead bullets coming out. Second type of shell was a HE, stands for high explosive shell. Uh, they explode when they land on the ground. So when they hit the ground, they explode and shells all together created 70% of deaths in the trenches.